Well, this morning we have an opportunity again to come before God's Word, and um, it's a wonderful, wonderful chapter, wonderful, wonderful passage which we're going to read about this morning. And it's a, a, a wonderful um, encounter which you and I might have heard about before, Jesus um, throwing people out of the temple of God, which is a, a story which I read often with my kids, and, and just really a, a great, wonderful story that displays the holiness of God. And we have an opportunity to discover that story this morning. So if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 21, uh, we're going to be in verses 12 through 17. And we will encounter this story right here, right now. It says in verse 12, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you not read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out to the city of Bethany and lodged there. It's about in the word of prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that you brought us before you this morning, Lord, to encounter you. And I pray, Father, that your spirit would cause us to encounter you this morning. Uh, certainly we can read your word, and these are just information that we can talk about. But what is most important is the fact that your spirit is working our hearts. And so, Lord, would you work in our hearts, Lord? Would you inspire us and, and just want the passage we read and things we talk about this morning to cause us to live lives that are, that are honoring to you and, and give you glory and help us, Lord, to, uh, to make decisions in life as a result of today's sermon that will honor you. Uh, give us insight, Lord, more insight into you and who you are this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we lose perspective of reality. In 1837, there had been a story, a story written by this man named, uh, this man, person named Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, he's a Danish person from Denmark. He wrote this story called Emperor's New Clothes. Have you guys heard this story? Yeah. <laughs> it's a particular story. This emperor is a very wealthy emperor. He lived lavishly and, um, and he wear expensive clothing. And because he wear expensive clothing, he had opportunity, or a couple of people who are swindlers, who are scoundrels, heard of this emperor and decided to come to trick him. And what they did is that they promised this emperor that they will make him a clothing that only those who are smart, only those who are intelligent will be able to see. And those who are stupid and foolish will see nothing. They will not be able to see the clothing which these two people make. So this the emperor gladly agreed and said, well, go ahead and make this clothing. So these two people went and created this clothing. Obviously, the reality is that they created nothing. They created nothing. And the day came, they said, well, emperor, here's your clothing. And brought to the emperor. The emperor did not want to sound foolish or stupid because this is a particular uh, clothing that can only be seen by those who are smart and intelligent. He said, wow, what a wonderful clothing you have there, let me put it on. So he took off his clothing, you know, stripped naked and put on this new clothing. Everybody, his advisors and those who watched this emperor said, well, what wonderful clothing would you have? Because at the risk of sounding stupid, foolish themselves, they did not want to admit that they can't see anything. So the emperor decided that this is a wonderful clothing that only the smart people can see. So he decided that he's going to go and show off, all his, show off his clothing to the whole city marched down the street and the people who are watching the emperor were noted that fact that the emperor is um, wearing a particular clothing that can only be seen by those who are smart and intelligent. So they all shouted out, what wonderful clothing you have, emperor, until one little child cried out amidst all the crowd saying, the emperor is wearing no clothes. <laughs> the emperor, however, at this moment, remembering and trying to convince himself of the fact that this clothing is only seen by those who are smart and intelligent. This is a little child. Ignore the child and continue to march down the street proudly. It's a story which sadly depicts many of us in this world. You see, the reality is that we're like this emperor who has no clothes. We clothe ourselves with many things of this world. 
we close ourselves with our ambitions, with our careers, with our achievements, with our accomplishments. But in the end, we're wearing absolutely nothing before God. See, what God sees valuable in us is holiness. What God sees valuable in us is a restored relationship with Him. If we're coming back to Him and fulfilling the, fulfilling the ultimate calling for each one of us of worshiping Him as He designed for us to worship. That's what God sees valuable in us. And this is what we're going to see today in this passage. We're called to worship God. That's why we're creative. We're called to, to give Him honor and praise. However, the reality is that we can't because we are separated from God. We sin against Him. We're separate from a holy God and holy God who cannot tolerate sin, certainly would judge His creation, but He has created us an opportunity for us to return to Him or offered us an opportunity to return to Him, and that is through the Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, He came to earth, lived the perfect life, died on the cross and rose again for us. He lived the perfect life which we couldn't live. He, he gathered all the righteousness unto Himself, in that perfect living, that He died on the cross to pay for the punishment that is due us for our sins, because we sin against a holy and a righteous God, and He died on the, and he, he died on the cross for that, and He rose again from the dead to show us that there's eternity with Him, that we may re-enter into the presence of God, worshiping Him for the rest of eternity. That is the good news of the Gospel. That is the, the good news that, that is presented by the Son, Jesus Christ. And today, we're going to see the ultimate good news, which is that we will worship God for all eternity. And that worship begins today. Yes. Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 to 17, talks about worship. It talks about the God who deserves worship, honor, and praise. And we are called to give Him worship. In this world, many people have sought after many things, have sought after their career and ambitions, their dreams, but none of the things will matter before God. What truly matters is worship. What truly matters is a restored relationship with God in which we're forever worshiping Him as God created us to do. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 12, 13, 17, we're going to see three reasons why you and I should worship Jesus. Three reasons. The first reason is this. We should worship Jesus Christ because... Jesus designed worship. God designed worship. We see this in verse 12. Verse 12 of chapter 21, it says this, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple and overturned the tables and money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Now, in order for us to understand this and in order for us to understand God's design for worship, we have to understand a little bit of who God is. God is worthy of praise, God is worthy of honor, God is worthy of worship because He is who He is. He is God. He created all things and all things submit under Him. And certainly all things were created, were created to worship. God will not create anything that will not or is not designed to give Him worship. And certainly men being a crown of His creation were designed to give Him worship. Psalm chapter 95 verse 6 says this, says this, Oh come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. This is our calling. Our calling is to bow down before God and to give Him our worship because He's our Maker. Yeah. And the way that God presents Himself is that He would dwell among us. He would dwell among us and receive worship as He is among us. Psalm chapter 22 verse 3 says this, it says, Yet you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. See, God's design is that we will worship Him as He is in our presence. This is the story of the Old Testament, by the way. God had designed for the Israelites to be uh, His people. God called the Israelites to be His people. And God is going to dwell among the Israelites as the Israelites worship Him. This is the original calling in Exodus chapter 29, verse 45-46, where the calling of God, the, the, the vision of God is presented to the land of Israel, or to the people of Israel, it says, I will dwell among the people of Israel, and I will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that might dwell among them, I am the Lord their God. God's going to dwell among His people. And we wonder how God's going to do this. In the light of the fact that we're sinners, even Israelites are sinners before God. So God created a particular place. A particular place where man and God can be at peace, and that place is called the tabernacle. In the tabernacle, man and God are brought at peace. The reason why man and God are brought at peace in the tabernacle is because, is because tabernacle is a place where worship and sacrifices are made. 
read about the five sacrifices in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus. There are the burnt offerings, the peace offering, there's a grain offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering. Many offerings are made, and these offerings are made sometimes grain, sometimes, most of the time with blood, with animal sacrifice, all pointing to Jesus Christ, who is going to be the ultimate sacrifice that will reconcile men and God. As men are offering the sacrifice before God, they're trusting God that God one day will bring the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ, to them for their sins. This is where men and God are made at peace, in the tabernacle. God will dwell among men because sacrifices are made, because men's sins are paid for. And that sin, those sins are paid for ultimately through Jesus, but those sacrifices were foreshadowed of what Jesus came to do. Now when Jesus came, he is proclaiming the same thing. He is a sacrifice. He's going to dwell among men. The very same language used in Exodus where God says, I will dwell among the people of Israel is used by Jesus in John chapter 1 verse 14 or used by John to describe Jesus in John chapter 1 verse 14 where it says the war became flesh and dwelt among us. And we see his glory, glory of the only son from the father full of grace and truth. God dwells among his people. Jesus dwells among his people. He's coming to make his presence known among the people. And ultimately, the reason why he can do this is because he is a sacrifice, which is to be made on behalf of his people. And in John chapter 2, verse 29, uh, John chapter 2, verse 19, rather, to 22, there is another uh, depiction of Lord Jesus Christ in that particular story. People are arguing with Jesus because in that story, there was another encounter, much like the story which we read here today, where Jesus actually overturned the tables in the temple, and people are asking Jesus, by what authority do you do this? And Jesus says, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. And people have no idea what he's talking about, except John later on made the Explanation in John chapter 2, verse 21, says that Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. He is a temple. He is the place where man and God are brought together to be at peace with one another. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why he deserves worship. He is God. He reconciled man and God. And when man worshiped the Lord Jesus Christ, he never, re- he never rejected worship. He's not like the angel in Revelations where he says, no, worship God but not me. Whenever man worshiped Jesus, Jesus accepted worship. This was seen. Amen. He was seen in Matthew chapter 14, verse 33. When Jesus calmed the storm and got into the boat, the disciples bowed down and worshiped him. That was an appropriate response from the disciples. They should worship and we should worship Jesus Christ. However, when Jesus came to earth, he was not worshipped. Worship was distorted by many people, by many of the Israelites who were living in the days of Jesus. The law of God, the commandments of God were meant to bring people to worship God. But instead, they were used by men to honor and exalt themselves. This was seen in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and, and Jesus rebuked to the Israelites and, and the Pharisees who were running the religious life of the land of Israel, saying, you are praying as if you're obeying the commandments of God, but instead of giving God the glory and honor and worship, what you're doing is you're drawing attention to yourself. You're praying in the big open streets so that you can draw attention to yourself to let other people know how holy you are. You're giving alms, but instead of giving alms according to the commandments of God, you're giving alms in front of other people so other people can see how holy you are. You're drawing attention to yourself. You're doing all kinds of things. You're fasting. Instead of giving glory to God and worshiping God through your fasting, you're drawing attention to yourself. You're fasting during the most busy days of the marketplaces. You're putting ashes on your head. You're, 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 just, you're, you're putting yourself up to be such an image that other people recognize you for this work that you're doing so that people may honor you and glorify you instead of glorifying God. This was a distorted worship in the land of Israelites during the days of Jesus. And as Jesus was ministering in Galilee region, and this was many distortion of worship, he went up to the Perea re- or northern Galilee region, came down to the Perea region, and now entering into Jerusalem from the east. He's going to enter into religious life, the intensity or intense, the most intense aspect of religious life in the land of Israel, namely in Jerusalem. He's going to find worship distorted in this area as well. Further distorted, greatly distorted, 
in the temple of God. We see this in verse 12. It says this, verse 12, that Jesus enters into the temple. Now, we're going to stop right there for a sec because we kind of need to understand what the temple is like. This particular temple is built by Herod. It's not the same temple that Solomon built. It's not the same tabernacle that was constructed by the Israelites and then uh, when they were coming out of Egypt. The tabernacle was a tent. You had, you had basically the basic elements, the holy objects which in the tent, which is the Ark of Covenant. There's an incense, and to the left there's a manure, which are the candlesticks, the eight candlesticks, and there's also the bread, the show bread. It's very simple. Solomon's temple is quite simple as well in the sense that it's just the building contains the same object. But when Solomon's temple is torn down in the Babylonian conquest, and eventually the Israelites rebuilt the temple, and Herod, when he came in, he wanted to please the Jews, rebuild the temple. He built much, much more than what was commanded in the Old Testament. He built basically a temple compound. It was not just the building itself. There was also the, the man's courtyard. There was a woman's courtyard, and out of the courtyard is the courtyard of the Gentiles. In the courtyard of the Gentiles, the most outer courtyard, the Gentiles can go into, and that's the only courtyard the Gentiles can go into. Going past this point, they might die. In fact, there was a sign that they dug up saying that if you're a Gentile, if you enter this place, you risk your life. So there's a courtyard of the Gentiles, and in this courtyard, we find the confrontation between Jesus and those who sold animals. People were selling animals for sacrifices. Now, animals were an important aspect of Jewish sacrifice. Obviously, they're the object of the sacrifice. They're the place where, they're, they're the animals that are needed in order for, for, um, for, for these offerings to be made. But people were not called in the Old Testament time to buy animals. They were actually to be brought on their own. And in fact, what happened here is that they were placing these animals in the Gentile courtyard because they thought the animals and Gentiles are pretty much the same thing, so they placed them there. But that's never ever the commandment of God. The commandment is that they will bring their own animal, they bring their own sheep, they bring their own goat to sacrifice. Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, verse 5 through 6 talks about this gives commandment to the Israelites to bring a particular animal for Passover. It says this, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs or their lambs at twilight. So what you're called to do is bring a particular sheep, a sheep that you raised. And the particular sheep you will bring to your house on the 10th day, and you'll bring it to your home. And this is the moment that you get attached to your sheep. You have, for four days, okay? From the 10th day to the 14th day, you bring this particular sheep to your home. Your kids begin to give this particular sheep names, and they begin to become a family pet. And everybody started to color around the sheep. Only on the 14th day, they found out that you're going to kill the sheep. And all the kids are going to be like, oh my goodness. Like, this is my pet. But they are learning. They're learning through this process that this is the animal that will take your sin away from you. This unblemished animal who deserves no punishment will take your punishment for you. That's the, that's the lesson. That's the pictorial lesson. This is lost in the days of Israel where people will bring their sheep in and they would literally get fleeced by the sellers and the traders were selling the animals. So what would happen is that the traders and sellers were selling animals who were cahoots, work in, 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 in cahoots with the, the priests. So they would bring the animals and say, you know what, this is our sheep. We kept this sheep for four days and the people are learning this lesson and thinking, you know what, we're going to kill the sheep. The, the kids' hearts are drawn to this lesson of the sacrifice that had to be made on behalf of their sin, only to walk through the court of the Gentile, only walk through the woman's courtyard, only to walk through the men's courtyard, to come before the courtyard of the priest, to find out the priest saying, hey, your animal isn't good enough because you didn't buy it. And they have to bring the sheep home <laughs> and buy another sheep. And Alfred, uh, um, uh, Alfred Ellersham, who is, um, who is a, a historian that, that, dictate, uh, that, uh, that um, studied much about the days of Jesus, said these sheep were actually marked up ten times as much just so that they can make some money on these people. And it's a horrible thing they're doing. Fleecing the people. And the lesson is completely lost. They were expecting to offer the sacrifice from their own home. And the kids were thinking, well, I, 
my, sac- my, my sins are placed on this animal. It's going to be placed on this animal. And now they have a brand new sheep that no one knows where it came from. Completely lost. And have to go back there again to do it. By the way, the money changers. Money changers are there because they took their money in shekels. Remember what shekel is? Shekel is a Jewish money. And if you know it back in the days of Jesus, they actually were reigned or ruled by the Romans who used Greek money, which are drachmas. And so they bring your Greek money and they're like, hey, we, we don't take Greek money. We take shekels. So they have to get the money exchanged. And guess what? There's a fee. And they even money that way as well. Constantly fleecing people on the religious devotion. People wanted to offer their hearts to God. People want to offer their devotion to God. People want to worship God and give to God what God commanded. And priests and other people were standing in the middle and saying, pay up, pay up. If you want to worship God the way that the Bible calls you to worship. Now, this is not just happening in the days of Jesus, right? It happened throughout all history. We studied through church history. We've been with us through church history during the Martin Luther period, right before the Reformation. What happened? Now, one thing that happened was what? Start with the I. Indulgences, right? Indulgences. People were selling salvation. Put a, cup, put a money, a coin drop in a coffer and springs up a soul from purgatory. That's what literally what the guy was saying, the, the one who was selling indulgences. Uh, the one that upset Martin Luther so much. And saying, hey, put money into the coffer, put money in the offering basket, and you will save yourself, your soul, from purgatory. People didn't know better. They didn't know salvation was actually free through Jesus Christ. So they were paying all this money because they thought that this is what I need to do to be devoted to God. And church was fleecing, the Catholic church was fleecing people in those days. But not just in those days, it's happening in our days as well. Remember, you know, you, you, you talk, we talk about the prosperity gospel, the war faith movement. It's the same thing. People are saying, hey, the reason why you're poor, the reason why you're not healthy is because you're not, you don't have faith. If you want to demonstrate faith, how do you do? You give to the ministry, plant a $100 seed, plant a $1,000 seed, faith seed, and you'll gain your health, you'll gain your money. I remember one time there was a guy who came to our seminary and he was talking about a particular instance where he was in this one of those ministries and he was quadriplegic, so he wanted to be healed. He eventually stepped away from it. He saw a lady holding a baby in her arm. The baby was sick with a debilitating disease like leukemia. And she was in tears, crying. Why is baby not well? I did everything I could so that God would heal this baby. And other people were saying, well, it's because you don't have enough faith. So she was taking money from her wallet and just giving more to the offering basket. And she was thinking that it was her fault. It was her fault that the baby is sick. Completely distorted view of how God works in this world. Is there suffering in this world? Will Christians, are Christians called? Are Christians sometimes suffering in this world? Absolutely they do. James chapter 1 talks about suffering and trials. In suffering and trials, you are to rejoice knowing that God's working in you to bring you to perfection, to grow your character. That's what God does. In fact, in suffering, and there are plenty of suffering that depicted in the Bible that sometimes a man who suffers doesn't even know why he's suffering except this brings glory to God. Remember Job? Job had no idea why he's going through what he's going through except God determined that this process he's going to go through must be for God's glory. And as far as Job understood, he said, I will worship God in light of all that. In Job chapter 19, verse 26, 27, says, After my skin hath thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold, and not another, not another. Oh, my heart faints within me. In other words, oh, my heart yearns with me. My flesh will be destroyed, but then my flesh will be resurrected, and I will see God. I will understand in that day why this happened, and all this will point to the glory of God, and in that day I will will be satisfied that's the heart of a believer a believer's heart is not to avoid persecution a believer's heart is not to avoid difficulties a believer's heart is not to avoid suffering if god causes suffering he's going to glorify himself in that process he does that is why in psalm chapter 84 verse 10 the psalmist made it so clear he says for a day in your courts better than a thousand elsewhere i'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my god than to dwell in the tents of wickedness i'm not going to to run to the tents of wickedness to seek or escape i'd rather go through difficulties in life and know that i'm right with god because when i'm right with god that's when i am most satisfied that is the true gospel that is the true gospel of jesus christ 
God designed worship to be in such a way. However, in those days, it was distorted. We're going to see a couple more. We're going to see more of this story, but here it is. God designed worship. He's worthy of praise, worthy of worship, because designed worship. The second thing we see, we see here is this. God demands worship. God demands worship. Verse 12 to verse 13. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple and overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And so we're coming back here and we saw the story of how these people were offering these opportunities to buy animals and this is ultimately against God and what he's said as far as the Jews and what they're supposed to do in terms of bringing worship to him. They're supposed to bring an animal of their own. It's supposed to be an animal which they're expected to sacrifice, supposed to be from their heart. All has been distorted, and Jesus enters the temple, and what he does is he threw them all out. By the way, this is the second time that Jesus does it. He did it the first time in, his, uh, in the, most, uh, the earliest times of ministry when he was still in Judea in the beginning of his ministry in the book of John chapter 2. We read about this just a while ago. Throughout everybody in the temple. Now, before we just kind of glance this over, it's thinking, oh, just one or two tables. Imagine this with me. Josephus. <laughs> Josephus, a historian in the days of Jesus, world antiquities. There are about two million people who come to Israel, on the, uh, come to Jerusalem on the day of Passover, on the, to prepare for Passover. Two million people. Now, the courtyard of the Gentiles is the largest courtyard in that temple compound. Now imagine you're going to serve two million people with animals and money changing. How many tables would there be in the courtyard? I don't know. Maybe a hundred? <laughs> maybe more? I mean, maybe a thousand people were there at a the time? It's a lot of people. It's not just two or three at one single table. It's a lot of people. And you imagine that Jesus were doing this. Like, why did someone stop Jesus? Right? Hey, 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 wait, 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 wait. There's someone holding back. They couldn't. Why can't they stop Jesus? Because he was God. He determined worship. He said, I will have it done this way. Nobody could do otherwise. Nobody could say otherwise. The animal just kept moving. I mean, it's like the Balin's donkey, right? It's like, I am going to go there. That's the Lord. I mean, animal knows better. And he just moved down. Tables get turned. And those who were exchanging money and those who were selling, they're just like, they were such shocked. They, they didn't know what to do and they knew that they were under the Creator Himself and they simply had to do what the Creator says. In fact, in Mark chapter 11, verse 16, it said Jesus would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. I mean, He really stopped everyone at the gate after the left and said, hey, don't come in here with that stuff and nobody could. He was God. He was able to do this. As he does this, he said this in verse 13. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. It shall be a house of prayer. By the way, this is a quotation of Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. It says, These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offering and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the people. It's meant to be a house of prayer. It's meant to be a house of prayer not just for the Jews, but for all the people. That's God's ultimate vision. All nations will fall flow to Jerusalem. All nations will flow to the temple in that millennial kingdom. All nations, all people, all tribes will come before God and bow down to Him and worship and pray to the Messiah who reigns in that day. This is God's vision for the temple throughout all times. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 29 to 30, when Solomon first built the temple, he had this vision. He says this, that your eyes may be open day and night toward this house, the place which you have said, my name shall be there, and you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place, and listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. It's meant to be a place of prayer. A place where God is worshipped, God is honored, God is exalted through prayer. A place of devotion to the Lord. But here they completely missed it. They completely lost their purpose. Jesus said, what did they do? Verse 13 says this, but you made it a den of robbers. So what does that mean? It's a place where robbers can hide. Robbers can, can, can feel that they're safe. 
People should be exposed. People who do wrong should be exposed, should be known for their sin, but they're made safe in this place. Should not be the case. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 8 to 11, by the way, is the original passage in which Jesus quote this quotation from. The entire passage actually reads as such. It says this, Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We're delivered only to go on doing all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? You can't be doing this. You can't be stealing, committing adultery, worshiping other gods, bowing down before Baal and come to this house and say, oh, we're going to worship Yahweh. This house will not accept you. You will be exposed. But that's not the case in the days of Jesus. The priests and everybody was running the show were actually allowing these traders to make money, allowing people who are there to make a profit, stealing peace from people, fleecing the people, and feel safe while they do so. It's a sad thing. So what Jesus does is this. He comes in, he overthrew everything that was happening. The traditions and whatever men were used to, he, he kicked them all out. Such was so different than what people expected when the Messiah to do. Just remember a day ago, um, last week that is, but for Jesus a day ago, he marched into Jerusalem. He marched in Jerusalem saying that, you know what, we're, and people were, were, were saying, Hosanna to the highest come that comes, here comes the son of David, here comes the Messiah. People were thinking that this one's going to come and overthrow the Romans, right? They want him to overthrow the Romans. Romans were such a difficult ruler over them, and Messiah comes and he will certainly do so, but Jesus comes and he didn't overthrow the Romans, but he overthrew, overthrew the temple. I mean, overthrew the things of the temple because they're corrupt, because Jesus' priority is always worship. The priority of all Christians, the priority of God is worship. Doesn't mean that the Romans are not doing anything wrong. Doesn't mean there are any injustices in the days of Israel. Doesn't mean that there are anything that needs to be changed, needs to be reformed. In fact, when the Messiah comes, he will reform all things. He will bring justice to the nations. But the problem, the primary problem, the problem that needs to be fixed first is worship. Judgment begins with the house of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. Remember the story with Ju- uh, Judas and Jesus? Mary in Bethany, before Jesus was crucified, days before, broke a piece of bottle of perfume, poured oil on Mary's head, I mean, on Jesus' head, excuse me, on Jesus' head. And what did Judas say? What a waste of money, right? This should be sold, given to the poor. What a great cause. What did Jesus say? Don't bother this woman. What she does for me is right. In fact, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 10 to 11, it says, Why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always had the poor with you, but she will not always have me. That's true. See, there are things in this world that need fixing. These things that need, need reform. These things that need to be brought to justice. But it will not happen apart from worship. That is why the whole social justice movement where you're actually working with unbelievers to bring justice to the world, but they don't recognize Jesus needs to be worshipped and just want a better life. That is not what the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that we will reform this world while bringing people to worship. You must have both components. You're not going to have either component. Well, if you're going to have one component, you at least should have worship. You at least should have worship. That is the gospel of Jesus that's why in John chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus says this, in, a light, in light of everything that's happening, in light of injustice in the world, in light of all the difficulties, in light of all the Roman rule and, and poverty and all these things that are happening and poor being oppressed, Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse 23, the hour is coming is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking for such people to worship Him. What is Father seeking? Worshippers. Worshippers. <laughs> Seeking for worshipers. That's God's, that's God's intent. God's calling men and women to worship Him. Worship Jesus Christ who came, who lived a life, who died on the cross, who rose again for us so that we may be brought to Him again. So therefore we see 
that Jesus is deserving. I mean, he is worthy of worship and praise. Two reasons so far. He designed worship. He demands worship. And lastly, what we see is that he deserves worship. He deserves worship. Let's look in verse 14 to 16. Actually, 14 to 17, rather. And the blind and lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant, and they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you not read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise, and leaving them, he went out to the city of Bethany and lodged there. And this is just leaking the glory of God through every single word that's displayed in this passage. So as Jesus was kicking people out, I mean, imagine with me the tremendous show of force, right? A thousand people, multitudes of animals, flipping over tables. I mean, if you were there, you'd be like, whoa, like the man is giving literally superhuman strength. I mean, he's superhuman, but he's giving a strength that no one can understand. And here you are, the, here it comes lame and the blind coming to Jesus. I mean, they didn't know. I mean, they, they, I mean, they, they knew, but they, they weren't afraid. And they came to Jesus, and Jesus immediately at this point just healed them. I mean, this is the wrath of God and the love of God both at display. This is a judgment day, by the way. The judgment day, they're going to be people who are afraid, who are scared, who are, who, who are, who are in fear of the holy God. God pour wrath upon them as they're sent to eternity in hell. And there are people who are going to be enjoying the love of God, being comforted by God at that moment. I mean, God's wrath and God's love as displayed at the same time in this passage. The lame, the blind, and those who knew they belonged to Jesus are not afraid of Jesus. Even Jesus is wrathful against those who sin against them. They are willing to come to Jesus and be healed by them. They're not afraid. That's us. That's us. But it's verse 15. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things he did, the children crying out of the temple, Hosanna, the son of David, they were indignant. People who are the chief priests were upset because what you have here, you have the children. The children crying out, saying, Hosanna, saying, Yashana. This is what we studied last week. Save us. Psalm chapter 118, verse 25. Save us. Son of David. Son of David is a, is a, is a description of the Messiah. It's another name of the Messiah. Son of David, son of Abraham. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Genealogy of Jesus Christ. Matthew writes to the Jews to display to them that Jesus Christ is indeed the Messiah. It's a declaration of the Messiah. Hosanna to the Messiah. Children knew. It was obvious that children should know because children see it the way it is. This lame, the blind people were offered brand new eyeballs. People who are lame, who couldn't walk, were offering brand new legs. And they were seeing what Jesus is doing here in the temple. Superhuman strength. And the animals even listened to Jesus. They were saying, this got to be the Messiah. I mean, children call it out the way it is. They do. You look at my kids. They call it out the way. Sometimes I tell them, hey, you know what? Like, Don't be so honest, right? But they're honest. They call it out the way this. When we, we, we become adults, begin to like take a step back and say, you know what, we shouldn't be so honest. But children have no reason why they shouldn't call it the way it is. They do it oftentimes here. That's what they do. They're calling out Hosanna to son of David. But the Pharisees were upset. They're saying, do you see what they're saying? Do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus says, Glad you know this. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Glad you know this. Have you not read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. It's a quotation from Psalm chapter 8, verse 1 through 2, where it says, O oh Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and the infants, you have established strength because you have foes to steal the enemy and avengers. They say, God is the one who gives strength to the weak. God is the one who gives strength to those who can't fight for themselves. The infants and the babies, they're the ones God will strengthen because they will recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And it's exactly what Jesus is saying here. And when the Pharisees don't believe still, verse 17 says, and leaving them, he went out to the city of Bethany and lodged there. That's what Jesus does. If you don't believe, after Jesus had made his miracles known, after he has declared who he is plainly, after all that has been said needs to be said, if you still don't believe, Jesus will simply leave you. Verse 17 leaves them. And where did he go? He went to the city of Bethany. Where is 
the city of Bethany. Why did he go to Bethany? Well, Bethany, there are three people that he loves. Who are they? Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. They're the people who believe unto him. And he lodged there. He will be with his people. And those who don't believe, he simply will leave them. This is the situation of our world today. You see, people today have all kinds of excuses for not believing in Jesus. They have. You know, where I studied in seminary, they tell us all the excuses and just kind of inform us of the excuses that people have. And this is from higher criticism and people who we think in scholarly levels, right? Scholarly levels. It's ridiculous some of the excuses that come up. They say, you know what? Uh, the Red Sea actually didn't part and during Old Testament time. Jesus, uh, the Mo, Mo, um, not Jesus, Moses and his people actually just marched through a shallow end of the Red Sea and they, it looked like they were parting the Red Sea, but they're not. None of the things, none of that happened. Red Sea parting didn't really happen. They also say that Moses and the God's people didn't actually meet God in Mount Sinai. What they did is they ate some mushrooms in the desert and they were hallucinating all of them, group, uh, group hallucination. They're just imagining things. Another, another thing about Jesus, by the way, is that Jesus actually didn't die on the cross. That's what we're saying. It's called the swoon theory. They, they said Jesus actually just fainted on the cross and took him down. He revived. So he didn't really die, so therefore he didn't really rise again. Others say, well, maybe he died, but he didn't rise again because people stole his body. That's another theory. A lot of theories, a lot of excuses coming from scholarly people, people who write books and journal articles about these kind of things. But it happened also in the days of Jesus, by the way, as well, in Matthew chapter 12, if you remember the story, when Jesus was actually healing people, uh, and he was healing a person with withered hand, he's healing people... Um, Left and right, and people in Matthew chapter 12, verse 23, were saying, can this be the Messiah? I mean, literally, he was handing out new eyeballs and new legs and new arms, and, and, and deaf could hear, and people who can't speak are able to speak. I mean, he was restoring everything. He was creating things out of nothing. And people say, can this be the Messiah? It's got to be. And the Pharisees said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, it says, well, you know, we recognize it's supernatural, but it's only by Beelzebub. The prince of demons had this man cast out demons. It's only by demonic forces the man can do this. Making another excuse. An excuse that is so ridiculous, doesn't really make any sense at all. I mean, that's what Jesus says, can Satan cast out Satan? I mean, what I do is for real from God. Like anyone can see this. Anyone can see this. You don't need a brain to see this. You don't, you don't, I mean, you need some kind of a brain, but you don't need to be super intelligent to see this, okay? It's so much easier just to believe that Jesus Christ is God, right? Much easier to believe in that. No matter what kind of excuses people give, in the end, God will receive the glory. God will receive the glory because in reality, in all eternity, all that's left is worship. Did you know that? All that is left in eternity is worship. This is something we said, well, last week, and we'll quote again, Revelation, chap Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 12. Talks about eternity and what eternity will look like. It says this after this I look and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation but all tribes and people and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels standing around the throne and around the elders of the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to be or be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That's the reality. That's the reality of all eternity. The question is, are we going to be in that reality or are we going to be apart from that reality? We are. We are. Amen. Amen. We're going to be in that reality. We're going to be worshiping God forever and ever. Yeah. So Jesus here is teaching us what worship is like. He says, hey, if you're going to be worshiping God in that day, that worship begins now. You need to recognize that He designed worship. You need to recognize that He demands worship. You need to recognize He deserves worship. So you worship Him today as He calls you to worship. If we worship Him today, what you and I need to do today is to believe. If you don't know Jesus today, you can't worship Him unless you believe in Him. You need to believe. You need to believe that He is the Son. You need to believe that He came to live the perfect life. You need to believe that He died on the cross for your sins. You need to believe that He rose again on behalf of you so that you may be eternally with God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's what Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and rewards those who seek Him. You must believe Him first. 
As you believe, what ends up happening to all of us is that we actually individually become little temples of God. Did you know that? See, Jesus is a temple of God. He is that temple, but we all are temples of God because the Holy Spirit actually lives in each one of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 made it so clear. It says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's Spirit dwells within you? You are God's temple. And so if you're God's temple, amen, you and I are called to be clean, right? We can't have any adultery worship going on in this temple. We can't be a den of thieves in this temple. That is why we're always coming before God and asking God to cleanse us. Now, we are sinners in so many ways, right? We, we're sinners in the sense that we sin, sin okay? <laughs> we still do, okay? So we need God to cleanse us. But whenever we have sin in our heart, we want to be clean, right? That's the, the attitude of the believer. That's what David said when he um, committed sin before God and says, you know what, God, why you wash me? Right? He committed great sin before God. He said, God, I need to be clean before you. If I'm not clean before you, I'm not happy. I can't rejoice. So wash me and I will be clean. Amen. Anyways, Psalm chapter 51, verse 73, I hear from the word of God. So purge me with his sub, I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear the joy. Let me hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken rejoice. I've sinned against you. My bones are broken. My spirit is down. But only when I know that you have cleansed me, only when I know that you have made me whole, I can rejoice before you again. That is the attitude of a believer. And so many people ask, well, how do I know I'm clean? You know, because Jesus Christ cleansed you. How does that happen? You confess your sins like what David did. First John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all righteousness. Right? It's not a feeling. It's like, well, I don't feel I'm clean, so I'm going to go and penance, uh, do penance. I'm going to whip myself. I'm going to do some extra Bible studies. I'm going to go share the gospel. I'm going to do this work for the Lord. I'm going to serve so that I can be clean. No, you're not clean because of what you do. You're clean only because of Jesus who died on the cross for you. As you confess your sins, as you place your faith in him, then you're clean. And you can encourage one another with these words. Somebody else live with so much guilt and shame because we, we can't let go of what we did. Faith in God is letting go of all that and say, Christ, because what you did for me, because your perfect righteousness, because how holy you are, how glorious you are, and how grand, how, how, how abundant your mercy is, is able to cover every wrong thing that we ever done. It's able. That is worship. That is worship. See, God is worthy of worship and praise. He's worthy of worship and praise because he designed worship Worthy of worship and praise because he demands worship. He's worthy of worship and praise because he finally deserves worship. Yes. Deserves worship. See, Jesus today, he's still turning over tables. Did you know that? He's still turning over tables. He's turning over the tables of your heart and my heart. That's how we got saved, right? Turn over whatever it is that we thought we were doing. I said, you know what, my life's doing okay. And all of a sudden, he plays something in our life. A holy interruption. He does, right? A whole interruption. Some of his sickness, some of his loss, losing a job, whatever it is. Turn over the table. So you know what? Focus on something else. Focus on God. Say, yes, I do need that. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. You know what? Jesus is still turning over tables today. He's using you and me. He is. It's called evangelism. It's called evangelism. That's when we go out there and share the gospel, right? So many people walking around and share the gospel, and they don't want their tables turned. We try to turn the table. They're like, hey, get away from me. Cool. But Jesus will turn the table who he's going to save. Whoever he's going to save is going to have their tables turned. That's what we're doing. Go and share the gospel. Hey, you need to stop pursuing whatever it is you're pursuing. And you pursue Jesus. Because in eternity, that's only there's going to be one thing that's going to matter. What is it? Worship. Worship. It's going, to be what? it's going to be all that we do for all eternity. And we want as many people as possible before the Lord in that day. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful that you have brought worship to our hearts, Lord, so that we can bring worship to other people's hearts as well. But we know, God, that you do so, Lord, through us. We know that you do so through the Spirit as a work in this world. So I pray, Father, that you work mightily in us, Lord, bring us out of the stupor of our lives, Lord. Give us a greater vision for our lives so that we will come to you and risk it all, for the sake of Jesus Christ, able to forsake it all for the sake of Jesus and say, Jesus, you're worthy above all else and we're 
more than glad and more than happy to do so. I pray that we will create a generation of worshipers for the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.